So, as you just heard, the title of my presentation is New Drugs and Drug News in Pain Management and Palliative Care. These are my objectives, to list new drugs used to treat pain and non-pain symptoms approved by the FDA in 2013, and for each drug, hopefully by the end of our time together, you'll be able to describe the approved indication, some common adverse effects, and any relevant drug interactions. And importantly, for each of these new medications, you'll be able to discuss the benefit and burden ratio and the role of each medication in caring for patients with pain or an advanced illness. I also I'd also like to sprinkle in some important drug safety alerts issued by the FDA and their relevance to drug therapies commonly used in hospice and palliative care patients. I have nothing to disclose, so let's jump in. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is one of these drug safety alerts from the FDA. They've commented on this several times in recent years, but as you can see here, it's titled, Safety Review Update of Coding Use in Children, New Boxed Warning and Contraindication on Use After Tonsillectomy and Adenoidectomy. So what's the scoop here? Well, the reason they are now saying this medication, codeine, specifically is contraindicated is as we know from the pharmacokinetics of codeine, it is metabolized to morphine. And we also know that people have different genetic predispositions to how well their 2D6 enzyme system functions. Most of us are just regular that are old rapid metabolizers. Some of us are poor metabolizers, which means you would be less likely to convert codeine into morphine. But we know that a good chunk of the population also is an ultra rapid metabolizer at the 2D6 enzyme. So they're going to turn codeine into morphine like gangbusters, so way more than we would have predicted. So we do see that some children are in fact ultra rapid metabolizers at the 2D6. Generally we see this is mostly children of Ethiopian descent, but the risk is too great and it's too disparate. It's across all populations. And also when you consider the differences among children and the level of risk they have for obstructive sleep apnea, the FDA felt that it was just a better idea altogether to recommend and black box the use of codeine postoperatively. I have to admit I'm not a big fan of codeine no matter how you cut it. It causes such a significant incidence of codeine. I think I see it on 10% of medication profiles that the patient is allergic to codeine when in fact what they really mean is the nausea. But this is a far more serious implication. So uh, if you're talking to a prescriber, there are so many other analgesics we can use postoperatively, it's best to avoid coding and of course the Tylenol number three and so forth. Another safety alert from the FDA is the FDA requires label changes to warn for the risk of possibly permanent nerve damage from the antibacterial fluoroquinolone drugs taken by mouth or by injection. So this risk is not new. I mean, we've known about this for a while, at least 10 years. It was added to the labeling in 2004. What do we know? It can occur pretty rapidly, even within a few days, but it can be permanent. I mean, it could last months to years, or it could be forever. And what do people complain of? Well, peripheral neuropathy, pain, tingling, burning, numbness, weakness, change in sensation, and so forth. Uh, so if this happens, you know, certainly I would counsel people about it. And if it happens, discontinue the drug immediately and switch to a different antibiotic. And of course, hope that that takes care of it by doing the switch. So an important thing just to remind everybody of. Uh, also, just to continue along that line, topical fluoroquinolones have not been reported to increase this risk. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can hang your hat on as an identified risk, uh, and it's unrelated to the duration of therapy or the patient's age. So nothing you can really say, oh, I saw that coming. Uh, so it is important to maybe counsel everyone on this. All right, here's another new drug. This just came out. Actually, I kind of cheated. This is a 2014 drug. Tazameltion, or Hetlios. Uh, this is a melatonin receptor agonist, and as you know, uh, the melatonin type drugs either hit the melatonin 1 or 2 receptor, and this one is stronger at the melatonin 2 receptor. Interestingly, this drug is approved for the management of insomnia uh, in something called the non 24 hour sleep wake disorder, which we see in people who are totally blind. So obviously, we do rely on our circadian rhythm to help us do things like go to sleep at night. And often that is driven by, you know, oh, it's getting dark, and then we wake up because it's getting light. But if you are totally blind, you don't have that as an assistant. So what happens is our circadian rhythm runs about 24 hours. If you're totally blind, it can run a little bit longer than 24 hours. So it disrupts nighttime sleep and increases daytime sedation. Now, the kicker is it can take months to see the benefit from this medication. The dose is 20 milligrams one hour before anticipated bedtime. 
For side effects, we see headache at prevalence of about 17%, increased liver enzymes, and nightmares and unusual dreams, each about 10%. There are a few drug interactions with this drug. Uh, again, the dose is 20 milligrams with or without food before bedtime. I think the biggest side effect of this medication is the wallet biopsy. So a month worth of therapy is a little over $7,000. So obviously, I don't think this is going to be a first-line kind of intervention, uh, but it is kind of interesting and something new. All right, another drug safety alert from the FDA, and this actually leads to the one that is subsequent to this, so I think we're seeing a pattern here. The FDA has approved new label changes and dosing for Zolpidem products and a recommendation to avoid driving the day after using Ambien CR. So what's with this? So what we've seen is um, the FDA took a look at the serum levels of Zolpidem after taking it the night before. And what the, the what the research has shown is a serum level of 50 nanograms per mil or higher is associated with an impairment in driving that increases the risk of a motor vehicle accident. So if we look at 10 milligrams of Zolpidem in a woman, for example, 15% uh, of them will have a serum level eight hours later exceeding the 50 nanograms per mil. So 15% is pretty significant putting them at risk for uh, a motor vehicle accident. Uh, and as you can see in men, it's only about 3%. But then if you look at the controlled release Ambien on the bottom of this slide, 12.5 milligrams of controlled release, 8 hours post-dose, a full third of women have a serum level over 50 and a quarter of men. And then if you look at even a higher serum level of 100 nanograms per mil, 5% of all patients have that. So we do have to be very careful. So what the F FDA has done here is to said, you know, we're not really going to mandate changes in the labeling of the dosing, but what we would like to see is shown here. So the starting dose of plain old Zolpidem for women is 5 milligrams, and if you really feel the need, you can go to 10 milligrams, but again, your 15% chances you'll have a serum level high enough for a motor vehicle accident. For men, still starting at 5 or even 10, and certainly going to 10 if you need to. For the controlled release, they recommend starting at the lower dose for women, 6.25. For men, it could be either, and again, of course, the maximum dose is 12 and a half. So I I think this is an important uh, thing to discuss with patients. Interestingly, they did not apply this to intermezzo, which is the very quick acting onset Zolpidem that is approved for a middle of the night awakening. But even with that product, you have to assure that the patient has sufficient time left before they have to get up and drive their Maserati to work uh, to make sure that the serum level has sufficiently fallen. So, unsurprisingly, very recently, again, I cheated, this is from 2014, the FDA put out another drug safety communication warning of next day impairment with the sleep aid Lunesta, or S-Sopiclone. Uh, so again, here they have recommended lowering the dose as well. So again, same citation here. They're saying that Lunesta can cause next day impairment of driving and other activities that require full alertness. So they've recommended the starting dose be lowered from two milligrams to one milligram, but the dose can be raised to two or three milligrams as clinically indicated, but the total dose should not exceed three milligrams. And then they further go on to say people who are older or folks with hepatic impairment because the drug hepatically handled should not get more than two milligrams. Uh, and again, the same sort of thing. People who get the dose of two or three milligrams may have a higher serum level the next morning, which increases the risk of impaired driving. So particularly counsel those people taking the three milligrams, they might want to think twice about driving the next morning or driving their backhoe. That's a big one too. All right, let's switch tracks a little bit here and start to talk about some different analgesics. So what's been going on with acetaminophen? As you all recall, back in January of 2011, the FDA published in the Federal Register steps to reduce the maximum dosage unit strength of acetaminophen in prescription drug products. They did this because we know acetaminophen is metabolized by the liver by three different pathways. And if a patient is taking an excessive dose of acetaminophen or they have hepatic impairment or something else, going on, they may run out of glutathione and then they're going to have the toxic intermediate metabolite, the NAPQI, which sort of functions as a little liver Pac-Man and runs around eating all your, your liver cells, uh, which is not a good look. So we certainly have seen also that patients, you know, especially three years ago and beyond, didn't realize that Tylenol and acetaminophen and APAP and uh, paracetamol all were the same drug, as, as well as them taking, you know, acetaminophen acetaminophen by itself, and then all the combination drugs that we see, whether it's prescription or non-prescription. So people were easily exceeding the four gram dose a day. So the FDA had an advisory committee meeting that made several recommendations. Some were taken, some were not taken. 
But one of the recommendations was to lower the amount of acetaminophen in any one tablet or capsule based on this risk that we have seen. They also added new boxed warnings addressing new safety information and the risk of liver damage. So they did implement this January uh, 14. They said by January 14th of 2014, we would like to see it that there's no more than 325 milligrams of acetaminophen per tablet or capsule. So what happened when January 14th, 2014 rolled around? So the, the FDA published this uh, drug safety alert and said, FDA recommends healthcare professionals discontinue prescribing and dispensing prescription combos with more than 325 acetaminophen. So what they saw was about half of the manufacturers who had greater than 325 were still producing these products as of January of this year. Uh, so the FDA said, we need healthcare providers to get a little firmer here and just not write for those products products and for pharmacists also to call any prescriber um, to say could we switch to something that has 325 or less and then the FDA said they were going to go after those manufacturers to make them adhere to this new regulation. Now I think it is important to look at you know what's going on with some of our more popular products so if we look at brand name Vicodin uh, they have certainly adhered to this new admonition. The newly reformulated Vicodin is a white capsule shaped tablet with a scored line on one side and they, on the other side they've got the name and there are three uh, strengths of Vicodin now. We have plain old Vicodin which is 5300, Vicodin Extra Strength which is 7,500 and then Vicodin HP I guess high potency 10,300. So what I want to point out here though is they did not go to the 325 milligram. They went to the 300 milligram. So even if a physician writes for Vicodin, there even the generic is expensive, as is the branded product compared to generic five three twenty five or seven and a half or ten three twenty five of the combination hydrocodone acetaminophen. All right, so this is a price chart just comparing hydrocodone acetaminophen. Uh, this pricing was AWP from in February two thousand and fourteen. If you look at the branded product Vicodin five three hundred one hundred and twenty tablets, which I took took to be about a month's supply would be over $200 and even the generic is about the same price but if you look at generic 5325 it comes out to about $65 and of course being the tight wad that I am in charge of my hospice drug formulary if we just switch those people to plain old Roxanol oral solution the 20 milligram per mil oral intensol that's about $18 a month at that same equivalent dose and the same thing holds true whether you're talking about the seven and a half 300 or three and a quarter and the 10 300 or 10 325 as you can see 259 versus 75 335 versus 80 so um, I talked to my sister who's a, a pharmacist she's the manager of a grocery store chain pharmacy and she said now the th 5 325 has become the fast mover um, so I think price is a limitation here all right, this is kind of interesting. Um, I got a, a mailer, a little f a flyer in the mail about Lortab Elixir, which is hydrocodone 10, acetaminophen 300 per 15 ml. And the only thing I wanted to point out is this is right from their package labeling here, uh, the dose. So if you look at the dose, they're unusual amounts. So 2.8 mLs, 3.75 mLs, depending on the age, of course. Uh, and if you look at this, if you take it a step further, so the volume of liquid prescribed is three-fourths of a dosage unit. So it delivers the usual adult dose of seven and a half milligrams of hydrocodone. So the usual adult dose is approximately two and a quarter teaspoons full every four to six hours as needed, not to exceed 13 and a half teaspoons. I don't know. I just think this is kind of peculiar this recommendation I mean people have a hard time measuring on a teaspoon of a medication let alone two and a quarter teaspoons and so obviously a household teaspoon is out of the question and the package labeling recommends obtaining and using a calibrated measuring device but they still don't give you any guidance on you know where do I find one of these so I just thought that was a bit challenging and, and thought that was kind of interesting all right so what are we seeing here this is interesting acetaminophen and alcohol ingestion. Acetaminophen in therapeutic doses, say of 1.2 grams or less, or light to moderate alcohol ingestion, which is defined as women having one drink, men two drinks per day, 
do not pose a greater risk to the kidneys. But if you put them together, taking up to 1.2 grams of acetaminophen in, in a day and light to moderate alcohol ingestion, this increases the risk of renal dysfunction by 123%. And this information was presented at the American Public Health Association 141st annual meeting. I just thought that was kind of interesting to share. All right, what's the next one we have to worry about? So this came out uh, probably early in 2013. The FDA drug safety communication warning of rare but serious skin reactions with the pain reliever fever reducer acetaminophen. So we all certainly are aware of these skin eruptions, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can progress to toxic epidermal necrolysis, and then this acute generalized exanthemous pustulosis. Boy, that just sounds awful. It sounds like something from Harry Potter, doesn't it? But this is pretty rare, but still warning of any rashes or skin eruptions when someone's taking acetaminophen, certainly time to call the prescriber and hold therapy. Another safety alert that came out uh, in early 2014, acetaminophen use during pregnancy. This was a study whose aim was to evaluate whether prenatal exposure to acetaminophen increases the risk of ADHD or hyperkinetic disorders in children. And what they found by doing this, this analysis of this database is mothers who used acetaminophen during pregnancy had a 1.37 hazard ratio of this hyperkinetic disorder in their children and ADHD was 1.29. So this is kind of scary because we've always said acetaminophen is the analgesic of choice during pregnancy because we certainly don't want to use a non-steroidal, which is contraindicated in the third trimester. But still, this is kind of scary that you're increasing the risk of 30 to 40 percent of your child having ADHD or this hyperkinetic disorder. Uh, I will say that they saw a stronger association with moms who used acetaminophen during multiple trimesters. So even though when we talk about pain management, we generally don't say suck it up and be a little soldier. Perhaps if you're pregnant, um, you know, certainly it's a consideration. All right, what about this plop, plop, fizz, fizz, not what a relief it is. What the heck is this? And this was an, a study that was actually done in the United Kingdom. And the researcher who did the study was a physician. And it was prompted by a pharmacist, actually. So the pharmacist called this physician and said, hey, you want this patient to take a daily aspirin because she had a stroke. But because of her stroke, she can't swallow tablets easily. So do you want to go with the uh, fizzy formulation? So the liquid formulation. And the physician said yes. And then I guess they got to noodling around and thought, well, gee, I wonder what's in the plop, plop, fizz, fizz to make it, you know, such an entertaining delivery system. Uh, it's probably the sodium. So went back and did a retrospective analysis following 1.29 million patients for 7.2 years. And what the researchers found was these effervescent, dispersible, soluble medications that contain sodium, there's a consequence to this. They increase the risk of cardiovascular events, such as an MI or CVA by 22%, a 1.3-fold increase in all-cause mortality, an increased risk of hypertension by 7-folds, and that's after they accounted for all the other risk factors that certainly increase the likelihood of a heart attack or a stroke, such as body mass index, smoking, or other comorbidities. So we, we do need to be mindful. Uh, not all those formulations that were looked at in the UK are available here in the US, but Anything that can be in a plop, plop, fizz, fizz kind of formulation, whether it's acetaminophen, aspirin, ascorbic acid, zinc, calcium gluconate, ibuprofen, and aspirin-soluble tablets, I do think we have to do an analysis of the benefit and burden. This is something that occurred pretty recently. Um, we have heard for years that certainly the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, whether it is a COX-2 selective one or a non-selective one, uh, can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease or a stroke. Now we have also seen from data that when comparing naproxen to other medications, looking at sort of parallel trials, naproxen seems to be the safer bet and possibly lower dose uh, salicoxib. So the, the manufacturers of naproxen petitioned the FDA to be able to put in their labeling, hey, we're a safer bet. So an advisory panel was convened to look at this and their advice was um, no, to not support this as formal labeling. They voted 16 to 9 saying meta-analysis data is not reliable because that's what these claims have been made from and does not warrant changing the prescribing information to reflect a differentiated risk. Uh, so they advised waiting to learn the outcomes of the precision trial, which has been ongoing for seven years and will be completed in the year 2015. 
So what is the precision trial? Prospective randomized evaluation of celecoxib integrated safety versus ibuprofen or naproxen, evaluating cardiovascular adverse effects. So I think in my next life, I wanted to sit in my office and come up with names of clinical trials, don't you think? So they're looking at people with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis who are at risk for cardiovascular disease as defined by the following, having three or more, age over 55, history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, a family history of premature cardiovascular disease, smokers, LVH, so left ventricular hypertrophy, people with an ankle brachial index less than 0.9, and people with microalbuminuria. So this is what they're waiting for to see the outcomes of this trial. I'm actually very interested to hear the outcome myself. It will be very interesting to see if the meta-analyses have been borne out, in fact, and naproxen is a safer one. And I imagine if this does show that by this trial, then I imagine the FDA would have to give them um, the ability to, to market that and put that in their labeling, this differentiated risk. So stay tuned on that. All right, continuing on with analgesics, how about schedule changes of medications? Let's take a look. So we have seen uh, from this summary of reclassified drugs, uh, SOMA was, was unscheduled uh, and it was switched to being a C4 in 2012. It's been proposed that dextromethorphan move from unscheduled to C5 status. Tramadol, as you know, is federally not scheduled, but 13 states have moved it to be a C4, which I think is a good move. I think it should be scheduled. And it's been proposed, certainly uh, in many states, that marijuana move from being a C1 to a C2 or even a C3. And of course, we're all over the place with with marijuana. The latest thing, and the thing I really wanted to focus on, is hydrocodone. It's been moved, been proposed to be moved from a C3 to a C2. Uh, this was a statement published by Janet Woodcock, the director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research in October of 2013, proposing reclassification of hydrocodone from a C3 to a C2. So what does the FDA consider when they come up with scheduling or rescheduling a medication? They consider the drug's actual or relative potential for abuse, scientific evidence of its pharmacologic effect, the state of current scientific knowledge regarding the drug, its history or current pattern of abuse, the scope, duration, and significance of the abuse, what if any risk there is to the public health, and its psychic or physiologic dependence liability, and whether the substance is an immediate precursor of a substance that's already controlled. So it's a prodrug of a drug that's already scheduled. So I think when you look at this laundry list of variables here, you can certainly see where hydrocodone you know, meets many of these. So it's the probably the number one dispensed drug that we see. People do abuse it. Uh, it's one of the top three drugs that people abuse. It certainly, it's, it increases the risk for death. So there is a huge public safety concern. And just like any other opioid, we do see psychic and physiologic dependence. So what is the scope of the problem? In 1997, opioid sales in the U.S. were equivalent to 96 milligrams of morphine. So in 1997, if you took everybody in the U.S., on average, they took 96 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per year, which is really astounding when you consider yourself, how many years have you gone without taking one dose of an opioid for anything? I would say I haven't had a dose of anything in maybe five years and before that, it was one tablet for a tooth I had pulled. So when you consider, but now in 2010, it's up to 710 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. So we are sharing an awful lot of love out there, aren't we? So this kind of is equivalent to every adult in the United States taking hydrocodone, five milligrams every six hours around the clock for 45 days. So wow, that's a lot of drug. And what's really scary is that we know probably a third of the hydrocodone containing products that are dispensed end up in the sock drawer or the medicine cabinet because they aren't being used. So we often see this statistic that the United States has 4.6% of the world's population um, but consumes 83 and 99% of the world's supply of oxycodone and hydrocodone. Now I know that is an alarming statistic but one thing you have to throw into the mix to consider is these are our drugs of choice. Other countries use other drugs and don't even have oxycodone and hydrocodone. So it's not like we chose to purpose abuse or misuse these medications. These just seem to be the drugs that we use most often. And hydrocodone acetaminophen was the most prescribed and dispensed drug from 2006 to 2012. This is just showing, you see the arrow at number one, number three, and number five, so depends on the brand that was dispensed. But if you put them all together, clearly, top of the list here, talk about your fast mover. 
So why, why, why are there so many hydrocodone containing tablets in the United States out in circulation? Why are they being prescribed? Well, you know, one thing that makes me a little crazy is if you look at patients who suffer with acute or traumatic pain or post-surgical pain or dental pain, uh, one prescription should get the job done. Number one, we don't need refills. So uh, I, I don't see that as a big detriment going from a C3 to a C2. And particularly, for example, like I just mentioned, I had a tooth pulled. The doctor gave me, the, uh, the oral surgeon, I think he gave me like 60 Percocet tablets. I took one. It helped the pain in my mouth, but I felt so goofy. I didn't even know I had a head anymore, let alone a tooth in my head. Uh, so I took one and I had 59 left over. Great. What am I going to do with these? So for pain that is very short lived, why would you give 10 to 30 days worth of medication? If the patient has chronic pain, why would we continue them on a short acting analgesic? Even though the data is not exactly thick on the ground showing better outcomes, switching to long acting opioids versus short acting, I think it from a quality of life perspective just makes sense to switch to something you can take once or twice a day or if they're an appropriate candidate for transdermal fentanyl or transdermal buprenorphine, that would be a three or a seven day duration of that the, the uh, medication is applied. So when we have these leftover medications hanging around in a patient's home and we know that's the number one source for people who use uh, the non-medical use of opioids is taking it from a friend or a family member, we do see diversion, unintentional misuse, recreational abuse, addiction, overdose, and death. Another way to consider what schedule a medication should be is something the FDA calls the liking test. How much do I like you? I, can, I call this the Sally Field test. So for those of you of a certain age, you'll remember Sally Field at the Oscars saying, you like me, you really like me. So if we look at how much people like hydrocodone, uh, various studies have shown hydrocodone 30, acetaminophen 975, same abuse liability as morphine long-acting 15 milligrams. People liked it just as much. Hydrocodone 20, homatropine 6, same same liking as morphine 40. Same thing from another study. Hydrocodone 45, it was same liking as oxy 40, same liking as hydromorphone 25. So my point here is people who are professional drug likers, people who abuse drugs, are quick to say, I like and would be happy to abuse hydrocodone just as much as oxycodone or hydromorphone as shown in the study. So it's equivalent to drugs that are already scheduled to C2. So why was hydrocodone and hydrocodone containing products not made a C2 right out of the gate when these drugs came to the market? The combination is a C3 because the thinking was the acetaminophen would provide an additive or synergistic effect, thus requiring a lower dose of hydrocodone. Uh, but that could be a lot of acetaminophen depending on the dose that's been prescribed. And you have to wonder, with these combination analgesics, at what point does acetaminophen cease to bring additional benefits fit to the table. And actually that's been researched. If you look at the data from the Scandinavian countries, when someone has cancer and they need an opioid, they're automatically already play, also placed on four grams of acetaminophen per day. So the researchers did clinical trials looking at patients getting an opioid with and without acetaminophen and the line in the sand seems to be around 70 milligrams a day of morphine. So in other words, people who were getting about 70 milligrams a day of morphine could not tell if their pain was better with or without the acetaminophen. So some of them got acetaminophen, some got placebo, and they did a crossover trial. So they really couldn't tell a difference. 70 of morphine is about 70 a day of hydrocodone. So if someone's taking the 10 milligram formulation Q4, we're already up to 60 milligrams. So you probably don't even need the acetaminophen at that point. But you know, do we have any hydrocodone products that don't contain acetaminophen? More on that in a minute. So that's kind of a moot point at some point in therapy. We do know that hydrocodone powder available to compounding pharmacies is already scheduled as a C2 product. So show me the data. Is it safer than other C2s? What's the scoop on that? So if we look at drug-related deaths from the DAWN network, Drug Abuse Warning Network, when they looked at all deaths compared to methadone, so again, methadone, you know, is, is implicated in 5% of methadone prescriptions, but it causes 30% of the overdose deaths. So if we look at methadone as the, the harshest line in the sand, obviously methadone causes 100% of the methadone 
hemorrhage-induced deaths, hydrocodone risk ratio is 0.45, so it's almost half as likely to result in death if you overdose on hydrocodone. Oxycodone, which also is a leading cause of opioid-induced death, the risk ratio is 0.26, so it's 26% as likely to cause death. So hydrocodone is actually a little bit worse than oxycodone. Now that is looking at all deaths, and uh, granted, many of the opioid-induced deaths are due to polysubstance abuse, more than one drug, alcohol in the mix, and so forth. When you compare single drug deaths, so the only thing the person took that resulted in their death was the opioid. Again, if we use methadone as, you know, the one, the relative risk of hydrocodone and oxycodone is about the same, 0.11 or 0.12. So methadone is the is clearly the most egregious, and although I'm a huge fan of methadone from pain control, you have to know what you're doing with methadone dosing because it is easy to overdose somebody. And if someone is monkeying around with methadone, it's likely to have far more dire consequences as shown by this data. But my point is hydrocodone is just as risky is oxycodone. Now there's another new product that is coming to market, hydrocodone and chlorpheniramine, called Vituz, which is 5 milligrams hydrocodone, 4 milligrams chlorpheniramine, Q4 to 6, and also comes as a liquid formulation. Uh, the indication is relief of cough and other symptoms associated with upper respiratory allergies or a common cold in adults. That was originally slated to be a C3. The FDA is requesting rescheduling it to be a C2. So look at this, uh, released February 26th of 2014 for a 60-day public comment period uh, where the DEA is recommending and would like to, plans to, reschedule hydrocodone containing products such as the Vicodins and the Lord Tabs of the World from a C3 to a C2. Uh, now the 60-day period has passed, nothing has happened at this point, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so we do know that there is a new product on the market that is hydrocodone by itself, not with any anticholinergics or acetaminophen. This is Zohydro ER. This is a 12-hour extended release formulation of hydrocodone by tartrate, and it did come out as a C2 right out of the gate. Now, I'm sure you have heard this product has caused quite a storm uh, because it, at, at, when it first came on the market, is not an abuse deterrent formulation. So I was kind of surprised by this too because the the FDA had a big meeting at the end of 2013 talking about abuse deterrent uh, opioid formulations. For example, OxyContin was reformulated several years ago. Opana ER came out with an abuse deterrent formulation. And other products such as Exalgo have abuse deterrent properties, for example. So uh, the, certainly the feeling was that the FDA really was invested in abuse deterrent formulations, particularly of long-acting opioids. They really hadn't, you know, weren't putting out the vibe that they were required it for the short acting but certainly for the long acting. So it was very much a surprise to the pain community when Zohydro was uh, introduced to the market and it was not an abuse deterrent formulation. It's, a, uh, it's again 12 hours and it comes as a 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, and 50 milligram formulation. Interestingly, the FDA advisory panel voted against approval of this non-abuse deterrent formulation 11 to 2. So it came on the market in uh, March of 2014, and there was a lot of criticism about this, and they asked the FDA, please reverse your decision. The concern was this would be the, quote, next OxyContin, referring to the original formulation of OxyContin, which was not an abuse deterrent formulation. Attorneys general from 28 states, a bunch of consumer groups, addiction groups, drug and alcohol programs, petitioned the FDA to prevent the marketing of this drug. But the drug did come to market. It is on the market. There were claims in the media that this is five to ten times more powerful than Vicodin. It's not a potency issue, for, for goodness sake. It's uh, hydrocodone is hydrocodone is hydrocodone. It's about the dose, so it's the tablet strength issue. So if you're comparing a five milligram, 300 uh, milligram acetaminophen Vicodin to 50 milligrams of Zohydro twice, twice a day, yeah, that's ten times more drug, but it's not ten times more potent. So the FDA did require post-marketing studies of Zohydro ER as well as other extended release long-acting opioids to assess the risk of misuse, abuse, increased sensitivity to pain, addiction, overdose, and death associated with youth over 12 weeks. And I understand that they are working very hard to reformulate this medication already as an abuse deterrent formulation, but it takes time to do those studies. Actually, uh, March 14th of 2014, two congressmen also introduced a bill seeking to withdraw it, but again, that did not happen. 
Uh, and this is interesting. This is uh, probably not happy news to the Zohydro people that in March 14, 2014, Purdue Pharma announced positive outcomes of a phase three trial in chronic low back pain with their new under development once a day oral abuse deterrent hydrocodone by tartrate formulation. So um, I'm sure that's another reason why the Zogenics people are working hard to make Zohydro abuse deterrent. So speaking of abuse deterrent formulations, here's a list of what we have on the market or certainly in the works. So certainly we're all familiar with buprenorphine plus naloxone, the suboxone sublingual film. Uh, buprenorphine is, is nicely absorbed sublingually. Naloxone is not absorbed so much, either oral or uh, sublingual. So if you use the drug as intended, no harm, no foul. But if you try to crush it or snort it or anything like that, try to make it into something you can inject, then naloxone becomes very much uh, bioavailable available and pharmacologically active and it would uh, blunt and reverse and block the effect of the buprenorphine. As I said, Exalgo, the once-a-day hydromorphone, does have abuse deterrent formulation uh, characteristics. It's the Oros push-pull system and it's tamper resistant. Uh, for oxycodone, we have several things going on here. We have Oxecta, which has what's called aversion technology. When they first worked with this drug, it was Acurox, which is oxycodone, and it had niacin in it, and it also has other uh, aversive agents, which would make it very uncomfortable if you tried to crush it and snort it. Um, they did not come to market. The FDA did not approve the Acurox, which had the niacin, because it was not determined to be sufficient of a deterrent. Uh, and, of course, everybody knows if you need to take niacin for high cholesterol, you just take a non-steroidal before you take the product. Oxycontin is, uh, has been reformulated from the OC to the OP. It resists crushing. You could ride over an Oxycontin tablet with your SUV and it is not going to crumble into a, a powder at all. Um, if It forms a gel with solubil solubilization, uh, whether you're intending to either inject or snort it. And in the works, the NDA submitted Targenique ER. Uh, it's a controlled release tablet also with an opiate antagonist, which would block the opiate if it was altered. And Opana ER also has some abuse use deterrent formulation issues. I just mentioned Targenique ER. The FDA has accepted an NDA for this product. It's a combination of oxycodone, naloxone, controlled release. So I imagine this will be similar to Embedda, which was on the market and is supposed to come back on the market. Embedda is a capsule full of pellets of morphine and the core of each pellet uh, is uh, naltrexone. So if you swallow the, t the capsule whole or you s even if you sprinkle the little beads on applesauce and swallow the pellets whole, no harm, no foul. But if you crush the little beads, either because you want to snort it or try to solubilize it and inject it, the naltrexone would override the morphine and I imagine this will be something similar. So stay tuned. This is going to be a twice a day product. Also, we just heard uh, a couple of months ago um, in March, Zartemis was approved, uh, Malincrot, Malincrot's um, extended release oral formulation called Zartemis XR, oxycodone and acetaminophen, gained FDA approval for the management of acute pain in patients requiring opioid treatment for whom alternative therapies are not available. So what is this product going to look like? It's going to be, it's a bilayer combination tablet of immediate release and extended release oxycodone plus acetaminophen. So one tablet is seven and a half milligrams of oxy, 325 acetaminophen. The dose is uh, two tabs, although I guess you could do one every 12 hours. So 3.75 milligrams of oxy and 325 of acetaminophen are in the immediate release layer of the tablet. And then the additional 11.25 milligrams of oxy and an additional three 25 acetaminophen are in the extended portion that releases over 12 hours. So even though the labeling does not include quote abuse deterrent language, the sponsor Malincrat will be working with the FDA to characterize these features. And you know the FDA has a whole um, algorithm laid out for who actually is able to earn the the moniker of abuse deterrent, which OxyContin currently does have. Also the FDA did take the advice of a group called PROP. The PROP petition petitioned several things from the FDA and they did accept this one. They changed the labeling from the relief of moderate to severe pain to for the management of pain severe enough to require daily, around the clock, long-term opioid treatment for which adequate alternatives are not available. So they've changed it to focus more on severe pain instead of moderate to severe pain. 
Also, they did change the labeling of extended release and long-acting products. In the limitations of use portion, new labeling retains language indicated long-acting drugs are not to be used PRN. Emphasize that these meds should only be used when alternative treatment options are ineffective, not tolerated, or otherwise inadequate. Emphasize this careful assessment of the tonal pain picture. New box warnings on the risk for neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome associated with chronic use of opioids during pregnancy. And they are requiring post marketing studies of all long-acting opioids with the REMS to be updated appropriately. Now here's an interesting product. This is intranasal naloxone called Evzio, uh, just approved by the FDA. Uh, it contains, as I said, naloxone, and as you can see, it's for near patient use. So this could actually be dispensed uh, to patients to be able to use at home. So as we know, naloxone is a semi-synthetic opioid antagonist indicated for immediate administration, emergency therapy in settings where opioids may be present. So it could be an emergency healthcare provider, uh, like an EMS techni technician, for example, or it could be used in the home. It reverses sedation, respiratory depression, and hypotension if it were given IV within one to two minutes, but this product is sub-Q, so it would be within two to five minutes. Um, so importantly, the half-life is 30 to 80 minutes, so the protective effect wears off 45 minutes after IV administration. That's important to me because as a person who does hospice for a living and we get a lot of patients on methadone, one dose of an opiate antagonist is only going to work for a while and then the methadone effect is going to re-exert itself. So this is administered according to the printed instruction on the label or it has a little speaker built in that guides you through how to use the product. So if you're home with your loved one and they accidentally took too much of their opioid and you feel the need, uh, you hit the button and boy, the speaker kicks in and says, here's what you do, Magoo. Uh, it's administered into an uh, anterolateral aspect of the thigh, right even through the clothing. And uh, I've given you, if you go to their website, you can see a video demonstration. That's pretty interesting. All right, moving away from the opioids a little bit, uh, we know that opioids cause constipation, so this is kind of a moving topic here too, is the FDA warns of possible harm from exceeding the recommended dose of over-the-counter sodium phosphate products to treat constipation. So these are the Fleet's products, either oral or rectal. The issue is severe dehydration, electrolyte uh, disturbances. Those are the big things. So we also know that people taking some of these medications listed here or the risk factors on the right increase this risk too. So they recommend not exceeding one Fleet's product a day, more than one a day. I recommend not even go, you know trying to make it a second or a third line option because of these risk factors. Another uh, new product here, it's not a new product actually, Lumiprostone or Amatiza has been approved for chronic idiopathic constipation and irritable bowel, but now they have gotten the indication for opioid-induced constipation. It works by opening chloride channels on the luminal surface of the GI epithelium, stimulating intestinal secretion of fluid and electrolytes and accelerating stool transit. It increases the number of spontaneous bowel movements by at least one more per week. Uh, so 27% of Lumi patients had one more bowel per week versus 18.9 percent of placebo patients. Side effects unsurprisingly are GI, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea. Now this is kind of a killer. You see dyspnea, so a, an uncomfortable awareness of breathing in some patients who get the 24 mic dose. So it's this feeling of tightness in the chest and difficulty taking a breath 30 to 60 minutes after the dose and it resolves in a few hours but still that is pretty darn scary. Uh, so I just want to point out also that there's a big cost differential. Senna, we can give everybody in North America Senna $3.60 a month when you compare it to some of these other options. So I do like polyethylene glycol, but that's quite a bit more expensive than Senna. This new pro this product, this new indication for opioid use constipation is about $260 a month. And then if you look at the peripherally active opioid antagonist methyl naltrexone, wow, that's $812 a month. So the medical letter when talking about lubiprostone for opioid induced constipation said it's a modestly effective option. So basically you're paying $250 a month for one extra bowel movement movement a week. And that difficulty breathing thing, that's a little scary. So keep it in perspective. This is interesting. This is kind of the flip mechanism. This is Crolophelomer or Fulizag. I love that name. Indicated for the symptomatic relief of non-infectious diarrhea in patients with HIV AIDS on antiretroviral therapy. It's comparable to loperamide. What's interesting, this is really a pharmacognosy product. It's a botanical substance. So the outcome endpoint was two or fewer watery bowel movements per week. And we saw this with 18% of the approved drug versus 8% with placebo. 
The advantage is it's a unique mechanism of action. It inhibits those chloride channels, which are the opposite of what we just talked about with lubiprostone. More effective in some patients. What's interesting is it's the first drug for this indication. No direct comparison to antidiarrheals. Uh, it's a very limited indication, and the side effects are not too onerous and are listed here. Precaution, it's not indicated for the treatment of infectious diarrhea, which must be ruled out. It's a 125 milligram enteric coated delayed release tablet, which you have to swallow whole. The dose is 125 mics BID. And the, how much does that doggy cost? $648 a month. Just a couple of quick slides. I call them drive-by druggings here. Just a couple quick tips. Uh, Tyvor Bex is indomethacin capsules and Zorvolex, Zyclofenac. These are micronized drug particles. So what they're, they're advocating here is much quicker onset. But of course, you do pay the price for this. And I already mentioned Embedda, which was off the market, is said to be coming back. It's the combination of morphine and naltrexone at that center core. But as you can see, it's anticipated it'll be pretty expensive as well. Transdermal buprenorphine, which has been available as a 5, 10, and a 20 mic per hour patch, now has a 15 mic patch. Uh, if you look at uh, AWP pricing, again, an expensive formulation for patches being $447 a month. Oxymorphone ER, which, you know, we've always had a PANA ER, now is available generically, but with all new generics, of course, for a while, still pretty expensive. And duloxetine, also available as a generic product. So this concludes my presentation on new drugs and drug news and pain management and palliative care. As you can imagine, there's always a lot of activity every year going on in this arena since we do have 100 million people who suffer chronic pain every day. And we're always looking for new ways to uh, more effectively treat pain but yet strike that good balance to protect individual patients and society as a whole from drug abuse, misuse, and diversion.